16. I, I want to read to you out of the book of 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter uh, 3. 1 Kings chapter 3, I'm going to read verse 16 to 28. I'm not sure if they've got the scripture. They have, wow, that's cool. I want to encourage you. I know that we've got the scripture on the screen, but I want to encourage you as a Christian not to rely on that. Get, get a Bible. Get a Bible. We should be the most biblically literate generation ever to be on planet Earth because we have more Bible available to us than any other generation that's gone before us. And right there on your phone, you can download the YouVersion Bible app and you can have a Bible there. You can pull your phone out today and you can be reading along with us. I want to encourage you, get a Bible. And if you're not a good, if you're not a good reader of the Bible, that's the cool thing about the YouVersion Bible app. You can push a button, it will read itself to you. You can get the Word in you. I want to encourage you, be lovers of the Word of God, not just lovers of the Word, but doers of of the word. The Bible says, Then two prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. One woman said, Oh my Lord, this woman and I live in the same house. And I gave birth to a child while she was in the house. Then on the third day after I gave birth, this woman also gave birth. And we were alone. There was no one else with us in the house. Only we two were in the house. This woman's son died in the night, and because she lay on him, she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while your servant slept and laid him at her breast and laid her dead son at my breast. When I arose in the morning to nurse my child, behold, he was dead. When I looked at him closely in the morning, behold, he was not the child that I had born. But the other woman said, no. The living child is mine, and the dead child is yours. The first said, no, the dead child is yours, and the living child is mine. Thus they spoke before the king. The king said, the one says, this is my son that is alive, and your son is dead. And the other says, no, but your son is dead, and my son is the living one. And the king said, bring me a sword. So a sword was brought to the king, and the king said, divide the living child in two. Give half to the one and half to the other. The woman whose son was alive said to the king, because her heart yearned for her son, O my Lord, give her the living child, and by no means put him to death. But the other said, he shall neither be mine nor yours, divide him. Then the king answered and said, Give the living child to the first woman, and by no means put him to death. She is the mother. And all Israel heard the judgment that the king had rendered, and they stood in awe of the king because they perceived that the wisdom of God was in him to do justice. I I believe that today in 2020, in the kingdom of God, that there is a spirit of division that is trying to work its way to destroy the church. Now, I would say to you that the spirit of division is nothing new. The spirit of division has been trying to destroy God's work since the Garden of Eden and all throughout the Bible and all throughout church history. So a spirit of division being in the church is is nothing new And that statement that is trying to destroy the church is not necessarily profound other than this. In the over 30 years of ministry that I have had in the church, I've never seen a spirit of division attacking the church so globally and so so collectively and, and, and in every church, pretty much in every city, in every state, in every nation of the world at one time. And I've never seen the church so blind to the spirit of division attacking the church and participating so freely in the division like I've seen it happening in the church of Jesus Christ in the year 2020. And so I want to speak a message. I believe that God gave me this passage of Scripture about a month ago and told me it was one of those moments where God gave you a Scripture and I didn't know why 
and he's just like, read it, read it, read it. And I've read this relentlessly over and over again. And I believe I have a prophetic word for the church today. Not just this church, the Cure Church, but to the church global. And I, I, I want to share a message today that I've simply titled this. Don't split the baby. Yeah. Turn to your neighbor and go, don't split the baby. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you that it's alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to get into areas of our life and penetrate and bring supernatural change from the inside out. We believe today, God, that there is a, a prophetic breath on this word today. And so I pray, God, that you would prophetically and spiritually, you would breathe on me that I would prophesy and I pray for the people, the men and women of God that are here today, that you would breathe on them, that they would have ears to hear, Holy Spirit, what you're saying to them collectively as the church and individually as the body. Work with us today, we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give Jesus Christ a great round of applause for His word and what we anticipate Him to say to us today in Jesus' name. I don't know if you've ever been asked to do something that you felt totally unprepared to do or asked to do something and then when you were doing it, realized that you were totally unprepared to do it. When I was 16 years of age, I began my career as a chef. I did an apprenticeship. It's a four-year uh, term where you sign up with an organization and they commit to train you in the ways of cooking and they pay you a very small wage. And so that's sort of how we did it back then in Australia. And so I, I, I was 16 years of age, fresh out of high school, and day one of my chef's job. And my, my, my parents were in the military, and so they made sure that I looked like a chef. I had, I had the chef pants on, and my mother had pressed those bad boys, and they looked awesome. I had my chef jacket on, and it was white. It was almost glistening with whiteness. It was so brilliant. And she had starched that bad boy, and it looked, I had the chef's hat on, and it, I looked a million, I looked like a chef. I never worked as a chef, but I certainly looked like a chef. And I'm on day one at work, going there, looking pristine, standing by the head chef, Chef George's Rene Auclair. And I was standing beside the chef. I looked like a chef. He was the chef. I looked like a chef. He was a chef. And six o'clock hit and meal service had begun. And the first order came in. And somebody had ordered a filet. Somebody had ordered a sirloin steak. And somebody had ordered a rack of lamb. And the chef turned to me and he said, Go to the refrigerator and get me a filet, a sirloin, and a rack of lamb. <laughs> so I'm like, yes, chef. And I ran into the cold room, opened the door, ran into the cold room, and I looked at the wall of meat, looking for a filet, a sirloin, and a rack of lamb. And at that point, I realized, I have no clue what they look like. I'm just staring at this wall of meat, hoping that I'll pick the right meat, or my life would be over. I remember at that point feeling very unqualified, very dressed up, and very unqualified. This is where Solomon finds himself. Solomon has just taken over the kingdom, just taken over the kingdom from his father David, and he is appointed as the king, and he begins his reign, but all of a sudden he feels incredibly unqualified. He, he, he describes himself as a youth. I, I, I'm too young to be able to, to be able to do this. I, I really have no clue what I am doing. I also remember that feeling when I was a young pastor leaving Australia and going to New Zealand to plant a church. I remember feeling so young and so unqualified and not really sure how to do it. I remember telling somebody, man, I, I, I barely know how to run a bathtub, let alone know how to run a church. And so we were just winging it. We just, were just doing you know, what we, what we thought we knew to do, but feeling unqualified. This is Solomon's experience. And then he has a God encounter. And he, and he goes to God with this feeling of, I don't know what I'm doing. And God's like, well, how can I help you? 
And Solomon says, I, I, I need wisdom. I, I, I need you to give me, I need you to give me wisdom. We are in an unprecedented time in church life. Most leaders on the planet today have never led in a moment like they are leading today. Many pastors that I speak to around America and around the world feel very, very underqualified for the decisions that they are needing to make at the moment. They are in a situation where they've been calling to deal with situations that they've never had to deal with before. And the challenge of it is like the targets just seem to keep moving. Like, like if it was just one stationary target that we would hit, then we could at least do something. But it's like you go in this direction and then all of a sudden the science or the government or whatever moves the target and, and now there's a new target to aim at. And we've never led through a pandemic before. And we've never led through situations like we've had to lead through this year. There's never been a time where we've had to, we've had to cope with so many different things. Coping with lockdown. And just, you know, church being shut down. And we've gone from church every week like we've known it to doing live broadcasts. And there are many leaders around America that had never broadcast live before. They didn't have the equipment. They didn't have the technology. They didn't have the knowledge. <clears throat> They've gone from a stage where you can move around and you can preach to a little tiny camera where you've got to stand in the middle of the camera and, and sort of try to convey all that that you can do live now on, on online. And it's an unprecedented time where pastors and leaders are calling for wisdom. God, give us wisdom to lead in this situation. And, and the kickback of that has, has been a church that's also trying to cope with all of those things at the same time, and we're trying to navigate, we're trying to do this thing together, and, and the challenge has been that it's birthed this spirit of division in the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, it says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of the Lord Jesus, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. He says, I'm appealing to you that there is no schism, there's no break, that there's no tearing, there's, there's no division in the body. And, and I'm appealing to you that you come together and you get your head around this so you can, and he uses two statements here, be of the same mind and of the same judgment. In other words, that you can, you can get into a place of agreement with the way you think and that you can get into some level of agreement by the way you behave. And that for us is a challenge. That's a challenge for the kingdom of God today. To be able to think the same and to be able to, be able to behave the same. Or, or more, more like this, to be able to at least get our head where we can go in the same direction. And then we can get our behavior to follow in the same direction. That is a challenge to the body of Christ today. Here's some of the things I think that we need to do if we're going to get ourselves into such an alignment. Because if it was easy to do, every church would be in alignment. If it was easy to do, every church, every church would align and would be in unity and would be flowing. But it's a challenge. And it's a challenge in 2020. So I want to throw some thoughts out to you today that maybe can help you get into alignment. And the first one is this. The church of 2020 needs Christians who are able to pass the test. Yes. Needs Christians who are able to pass the test. In verse 16, the Bible says that two prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. Solomon asked for wisdom and immediately he faces a test. Solomon asks God for wisdom, and what happens? Immediately, two prostitutes come and stand before him, and they've got a situation that needs wisdom. I, I want to encourage you, be very, very careful what you ask for. Because what you ask for is going to be followed by a test. A Elijah prophesies drought. Elijah challenges 
uh, Israel's most evil king, King Ahab, seventh king of the northern kingdom, that there is no, that the benchmark of bad kings is a king called Jeroboam, and Ahab considers the sins of Jeroboam as trivial. Ahab is a bad king. And Elijah walks into the throne room of the worst king of Israel's history and challenges him and says, listen, you believe that your God Baal controls the weather? I'm telling you that my God is the God who controls the weather and there'll be neither dew nor rain at any point until I say so, until my God releases it. And that's a big thing to prophesy drought. But you know where God sends him after he prophesies drought? To a brook. He sends him to the brook Kareth. That's where he goes, to a brook. What's the first thing that's going to run out of water in a drought? A brook. And I prophesy drought, I want God to send me to a lake. Or to a spring or to a well. Not to a brook. But when you prophesy drought, God's going to test you. Are you up to handling the words that you can say? Are you up to be able to handle the, the standard that you set? There's always a test. When Jesus was baptized and God ordained him as this is my son who I'm well pleased, immediately he went into a test. He went into a test of do you believe what God just said about you? So it's easy for us to say things. But are we able to handle the test? I blame the worship leaders for 2020. And some of you for singing the songs that the worship leaders wrote. Because you didn't think about it. I want nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else. Take it all away. Take everything. I don't need anything. I don't need my job. I don't need to go to the mall. I don't need to go shopping. I don't need restaurants. I don't need fun. Just, just shut it all down. Close it down in March and put us in isolation for 115 days. It's because I just want you. That's what I want. Nothing else. Nothing else. I didn't sing those lines. You sung those lines, and now we're paying for it. Face a test. Jesus says to the disciples, listen, you're all going to fall away because of me. Because it says you smite the shepherd and the sheep will run. Peter's like, no way. Not going to happen to me. And Jesus' like, yeah, you'll deny me three times. Ha <laughs> ha, no. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> Bible says, count it all joy, my brethren. When you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith will produce endurance and let endurance have its perfect reward, making you perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Here's why I don't pray for trials. Because the scripture told me they're coming. I don't pray crush me, break me prayers. I don't sing crush me, break me songs. I don't sing I want nothing else but you because there's some other things that I like. I like wearing clothing. I don't want to walk around naked. I like having a vehicle. I like having a house. There's other things in life. I get the sentiment of the song, but don't ask for things that you are not able to endure when you get the answer to your prayer. Well, at least endure them with joy. We've been put into a test this year. This has been a test. And, 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 and the, the test has come where you've got to be able to count it all joy. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be happy about everything. But don't lose your joy. The Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Get your shoulders back. It's a test. Consider it all joy because you will get through the other side and it will produce endurance in your life. You say, well, what, 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 where can I find joy? Well, look for it. There, there, there was a, a, a lady some years ago, her name was Mrs. Osler, wonderful woman. She gave me some incredible wisdom. She was having issues with one of her sons. And she said to me, you know, I, when, I, when I look at him, there's... There's nothing about his life that makes me happy. There's nothing about his habits. There's nothing about his lifestyle. 
There's nothing about the way he treats us as a family that I like. I can't find anything in my son that gives me pleasure. And she said, so I had to look for it. And she said, so I decided my son has beautiful eyes. I just found the one thing that would give me joy. My son has, and as soon as I started to focus on the one thing, she said, it was amazing how all the other things started to turn around. When I could focus on the one thing, I want to encourage you, what's the one thing about 2020 that you can look at? What's the one thing about this year that you can say, you know what, I may not like everything else that happened, but this one thing happened this year, and this was awesome. I, I am so glad. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to count it all joy. You know, I, I, I'm like many people. I, I travel. I itinerate. That's how I make my living. That's what God's called me to do. And when the whole thing hit in March, everything stopped. I literally became unemployed in March. Had no income coming in, no finance flowing in, no one knocking on my door, throwing money my way, couldn't travel, couldn't do all the things that God has called me, my, me to do. And so we went under financial pressure. But you see, I've been doing this thing a long time. So for me, it wasn't so much of an issue of a testing of my faith because God tested me on my faith of having no money 30 years ago and I knew how to pray finance in. And so I just started doing what I do. God, God, this may have caught... Everyone else by surprise and me by surprise, but I know it didn't catch you by surprise, so I am not going to freak out about money. I'm not going to stress about money. I'm going to pray finance in. I'm going to believe income to come in, and God has met us all along the way. But, but, but being met with the money is not the joy part. What I found out was, man, because I travel, I've never had so much time with my wife as I've had in these last few months, and it's been amazing. So it may have been a horrible year for everybody else, but I've had a holiday with my wife for three months, and that's been amazing. Just find the one thing. I, there's a whole heap of other things I don't like, but that's the one thing I do like. Consider it all joy. You've got to make a decision that this season is not going to take you out, that you are bigger than the moment, that you are better than the moment, that you are bigger and better and bolder and braver, and God's Spirit is in you. You've got to count it all joy. You're going to have endurance. You're going to make it through. 2021's coming. 2022's coming. You're going to make it. Don't quit. Don't stop. Don't give in. Keep on track. Keep your faith strong. Don't throw away your faith. Don't throw away your confidence. Don't throw away your connection to the church and the body of Christ. Here's the second thing. Do I have a clock timing me? Because this is dangerous. What time do we finish service? Just so I can some indicator. What time do you normally finish? 11.30, 11 good. Okay, cool. That doesn't mean anything. But <laughs> just so you know. But at least some of you are thinking, oh, wow, he really does care about time. <laughs> the Church of 2020 needs Christians with perspective. The Church of 2020 needs Christians with perspective. Verse 17 and 18. Then one woman said, oh, my Lord, this woman and I live in the same house. And I gave birth to a child. While she was in the house. Then on the third day after I gave birth, this woman also gave birth. So their experience is pretty similar. Pre pretty much other than a few days, they're living in the exact same experience. They live in the same house. They're both pregnant. They both give birth. They give birth. Their babies are only three days apart. So pretty much everything about their experience, they're walking through together. I want to encourage you as the church, that's what the world is doing right now. We're walking through an experience together. That's why they call it a pandemic. Because it's happening in every nation around the world at the same time. This is a global experience together. And, and what is um, not helpful is if you forget that we're walking through this together and that you just somehow isolate it to your situation. I had somebody I was talking to the other day and they said to me, oh, because they call it the pandemic, and they said to me, this will all be over in November. November 3, we'll be all done. I'm like, how'd you work that out? And they said, well, it was all just about getting Trump out. This is all a conspiracy to get Trump out. It was planned. It was orchestrated. The media, 
And, and I said to him, I could probably follow your logic on that if, if this was an epidemic and was only happening in America. If this was just a thing we were walking through in America as an epidemic, then I could probably go, mm, I can see where your logic could potentially be accurate. But it's pretty small thinking, if that's your thinking, because what you're saying is the whole world wants to get Trump out. And Australia is so determined to get him out that they're going to crash their economy. And New Zealand is so determined that they're going to crash their economy. And England is so determined they're going to crash their economy. And Canada is so determined they're going to... And, and Peru is so determined they're going to crash their economy. We're important, but I want to tell you, we're not that important. Like, it's a great nation. I love America. I choose to live here. I love America. And we're important, but we're not that important that every other nation on the planet is trying to destroy their economy just so we can change our election. You only think like that because you're in an epidemic. Where you're just, no, this is a global thing that we're walking through. We're walking through all sorts of things together. Then we're walking through racial tension and other things that are happening. There's an attack on the world right now. And it doesn't need a church that's in retreat. And it doesn't need a church that's in conspiracy mode. And it doesn't need a church that, 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 that is pulling back and, and getting... No, it needs a church that will love the world. It needs a church that will unite together. It needs a church that's going to move forward in strength and in faith. Here's the third thing. The church of 2020 needs Christians with discernment. Verse 17 says, Then one woman said, I want to encourage you. Be really careful what you listen to. There's something powerful one woman said. She got it, one woman. One woman gets up there and she tells her story. One woman says, This woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. She rose at midnight and took my son from beside me while your servant slept and laid him at her breast and laid her dead son at my breast. When I arose in the morning, the nurse, my child, behold, he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning, behold, he was not the child that I come. This is what the mother is saying. So the mother gives this story. Everyone says the mother gives a story. Everyone say the mother gives a story. Well, that may not be true. We're not even told who this woman is. She could be the mother telling the story, or could she be the other lady making up the story? We don't get that information. But the truth is, if I told you before this is the mother telling the story, then you'd probably go home believing this is the mother telling the story. Because you probably wouldn't go back and investigate it to find out whether it was the mother telling the story. The only reason I know it could have been either is because I'm reading it, I first thought, oh, this is the mother telling the story. Then I went back and read it again. I'm like, well, it doesn't say whether the mother, I'm not even sure this is the mother telling. It could be either of them. But the Bible as it says, when the first man to please his case sounds like he's right until he's examined by his neighbor. Then one woman said, it's so easy. The serpent says to Eve, has God really said? Words have power. Nehemiah's trying to build the wall and he's got all these people that are saying stuff to try to get him stopping what he's doing. And then they make this little comment about Geshem says, well, why would you listen to Geshem? Because Geshem is one of the people that's trying to get him to stop building the wall. But they're trying to validate this, these words by throwing names in. One woman said, be careful what you listen to. Don't get your news from social media. Social media just will just feed you whatever you feel like you need to be fed. But there's crazy stuff on social media. I got one guy who was a friend who was in our church in New Zealand. I just had to sort of silence him. Because his posters, first of all, they entertained me. Every day I'd read his conspiracy theories and they were entertaining. Because I'm thinking, seriously, you believe this stuff? Then they just started to annoy me. Then, it, then I think he's just starting to lose his mind. And I challenge him on stuff. You know none of what you just post. And I, I, know, I never post on someone's timeline because I don't want to be a part of the debate. So I direct message him. You know nothing about what you posted today was true. Nothing. Did you fact check it? You probably should research before you repost. So he just said right back to me, I'm allowed to post whatever I want. And I said to him, yeah, you can post whatever you want. 
if you want to look like a fool. But when you post lies, you look like a fool. So now he's angry at me on the fact-checking guy. So now he'll post these little posts. Fact-check this. I'm like, why should I fact-check it? You're lazy. You fact-check it before you look like an idiot. He posted this one thing this, this past week with a photo of a, 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 a prostitute. I don't know if you saw this. On, and, and hugging up to a, one of the Bible characters, uh, one of the um, Frozen characters. And the accusation was Disney named this character after this uh, porn star. I'm not even sure what his point was. And his, on top of it was, fact check this. So I did. <laughs> and the movie Frozen came out in 2013. And the girl became a porn star in 2015. So is he saying that Disney was being prophetic? I just want to encourage you, be careful what you entertain on social media. Be careful when you, you entertain divisive opinions. The Bible says that God hates those who sow discord amongst the brethren. Hates those who sow discord amongst the brethren. Don't, don't believe everything you hear just because it agrees with your opinion. Don't believe everything you hear because it sounds feasible. Don't believe everything you hear because it validates your narrative. Don't believe everything you hear because it fuels your hurt. And don't believe everything you hear because it empowers your excuse. Learn how to challenge what you hear. Don't let it just feed you. You, 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 you've got to be careful of accusations against church leadership, accusations against the church. Be careful what you feed yourself on. In this season, hang with people that are going to fuel faith. Hang with people that are going to build your soul. This is, not a, this is not a season to hang people that just fuel negativity in your world. The Church of 2020 needs Christians who value being the church and being the body of Christ. The Bible says in verse 18, there was no one else with us in the house. Only we two were there in the house. It re-emphasizes this thing, we were alone. We were alone. No one was there. No one was around. We were alone. I, I want to encourage you. And, I, and I, I'm sort of preaching to the choir today because you're here. But I want to encourage you, value this beautiful thing that we've got called the church. I wonder whether God took it away from us. Because prior to going into isolation, we didn't really value it. Because I thought it was entertaining that in California... All the churches were rising up and all the Christians were rising up because the governor of California said, you can't worship. You can't worship. And we're like, what do you mean we can't worship? <laughs> and we should be like that. But we're angry about something that most of us turn up to 15 minutes after it began. <laughs> we waddle in, we waddle in to a, you know, to a 10 o'clock service at 10, 15. Just waddling in every week. Missed half of worship. We've been singing for 15 minutes. You're going to get five. You're going to get five. You're going to get, you're going to get a song. You're going to get a song. And, and we've devalued worship. But now when they took it away, you can't take it away. We've devalued church. The average Christian shows up to church once every four weeks. That's, that was the state of the church in America. Every four weeks. And, and I've church after church, checking out their, their attendance, and, and most of them checking out when their kids are in church. Checking the, how often you check your children, children coming once every four weeks. And then we take it away, which meant in the four months that we were shut down, you missed four church services. That's all you missed. Because we didn't value being together. It's not good for man to be alone. We're created for community. We're created for the body. We're created for the church. And if this thing births anything in us, it should birth in us a greater love for worship, a greater love for turning up on time, a greater love for the church, a greater... The reason we're weaker spiritually is because we haven't been joining together as the body. God's designed it. The real masks on us are not the masks on our face. The real masks on the church is the mask of isolation. 
because it stopped the church from breathing. When we come in like the early church, when we come in like the day of Pentecost, we get filled with the breath of God. We get filled with the Holy Spirit. We get filled with the touch of God. And then we go out into our community and we exhale into our community the love of God and the faith of God and the encouragements of God. And we minister to our community by exhaling. And then we come back on Sunday together in worship and we inhale the breath of God and we get the touch of God and we go out into our community and we exhale into our community the, the love of God and the touch of God and the ministry of God. We're supposed to have this pattern of coming in as the ecclesia, gathering together, getting filled with the Spirit, and going out into the world and touching our world to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost parts of it with the love of God. It's the inhaling and the exhaling of the Spirit of God that gives breath to the body of God. And isolation masks that, and we end up breathing our own oxygen. And inflating ourselves on our own opinions and disconnecting from the body of Christ. I pray that 2020 gives us a passion to come back together, to gather together. And, and maybe you're watching online and you don't feel safe to do that. And I get that at the moment. And you should come back at a time when you feel safe. But I do want to encourage you. There has to be a season. Don't let being at home become a habit. Don't let being at home become a habit. Watching online is okay, but it's not like the same as gathering together and hugging other people and loving on other people and being there for other people and praying for others and participating in this beautiful thing called the body of Christ. Two more thoughts. The Church of 2020 needs Christians with a heart of unity. They need Christians with a heart of unity. Therefore, the king said, the one says his son is alive, your son is dead. The other says, no, but... Your son is dead and my son is the living one. The king said, bring me a sword. So a sword was brought before the king. And the king said, divide the living child in two. And give half to one and half to the other. I, I, I do honestly believe that most Christians are unaware on how divisive their conversations have been for the church. It's put pastors in no-win situations. No win, you can't win. When the George Floyd funeral took place in Minneapolis, um, my pastor, Pastor Steve Muncy, uh, was taking Reverend Jesse Jackson, because they'd been friends for a long time, up to the funeral. And so they had a, I had a jet they were taking up and uh, Kent Muncy, my best friend, and the church that we're based at, my, our pastor, and, uh, and one of Jesse Jackson's sons, I think it was Jonathan, the four of them went. And so they said, hey, when we get there, I know you've got contacts in Minneapolis, can you, can you have somebody host us for the day? So I rang a friend of mine, Jonathan Brozerzog, who pastors Creative Church. I said, hey man, can you do me a favor? Pastor Muncy's bringing up Jesse Jackson, they're going to the funeral, then they want to go, can, can you host, can you get a couple of SUVs? Can you get a couple of your guys to dress up nice and just host them for the day? And so that's what they did. And so they drove them to the funeral, and then Reverend Jackson wanted to go to the spot where the death was and, go and, 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 and minister to the people that were there. And, that, and, and my friends were telling me it was mind-blowing, just the hearts of people opening up when they saw him come through. And, uh, and so they did that. And uh, my friend posted on Instagram what they were doing on the day. He thought it was interesting. He had people leave his church because he hosted Reverend Jackson. White people leave his church because he hosted Reverend Jackson. Then he had black people leave his church because he took photos of hosting Reverend Jackson and felt like he was just doing it for a photo opportunity. You can't win. The same church, they had people leave the church because they closed the church down too early when the pandemic happened. Now he's got people leaving the church because they're opening it up too quick. We're so divided. And, and what we've done now is we, we've weaponized our division. We've weaponized our opinions. We've taken our opinions from being opinions and made them little gods. It's not bad to have an opinion. Pastor has an opinion. I have an opinion. Sometimes we have difference of opinion. But opinion's not bad. But when you make your opinion a little God, how do I know that you've made your opinion a little God? Well, you've changed the word. It's no longer my opinion. Now it's my truth. Because now I'm not just challenging your opinion. Now I'm challenging your truth. Because you really, this is my truth. But how do I know that it's become a little God? 
because it's become a little God when you demonize the opposing opinion. Your opinion is a God when you demonize the opposing opinion. What do I mean? Well, maybe you've heard some of these. Uh, one says, wear a mask, it will protect you. The other says, wearing a mask is a breach of my liberty. One says, uh, a mask he helps the least of these. And the other says, the mark is of the beast. One says, let's go back to church now. The other says, let's wait until there's a vaccine. One says, black lives matter. And the other one says, all lives matter. One says, the vaccine will bring a cure to COVID. And the other says, the vaccine has baby fetus in it, a tracking device and causes medical issues and a part of the mark of the beast. One says, if you vote Democrat, you can't be a Christian. The other says, if you vote for Trump, you can't be a Christian. And we've weaponized our opinions. Look, you're entitled to your opinion. The Bible doesn't say removal of the mind. It says renewing of the mind. So it's okay to think. I'm not telling you don't think. And I'm not saying don't even be passionate about your opinion. But when you demonize somebody else who has an opposing opinion, then you've weaponized your opinion to become a little God. And it causes division. Some of these things, just to be honest with you, aren't worth posting. They aren't worth saying. They're just not worth hurting people about. Whether you wear a mask or don't wear a mask, I don't think it's such a big deal. I wear a mask because I live in Chicago because I can't work out at the gym if I don't wear a mask. Do I enjoy wearing a mask at the gym? No. Do I hide in the corner every now and then go and suck some fresh air? Yes. Do I feel like it's a lack of my, I feel like an attack on my liberty? No. Because there's other things I've got to do that I don't enjoy doing. I don't like wearing a seatbelt, but I wear a seatbelt. I don't like sitting at a red light when there's no traffic. <laughs> Waiting for it to turn green. I don't have that level of patience. But I do I do it? Yes. Why? Because that's what they're asking me to do. It's, is that an attack on my liberty? No. It's, does that make sense? I just think there's some fights that are just not worth fighting. And I think as the church, why are we fighting about masks, whether somebody should or shouldn't, when there's more important things in life about the soul of people and about the welfare of people and about our community? Last thought. The church of 2020 needs... Christians to be aware that the devil's trying to split the baby. One woman said, well, her son is alive because her heart yearned for her son. Oh, my Lord, give her the living child. And by no means, by no means, please don't split the baby. King said, that's the mother. How does he know it's the mother? Because the mother's heart was willing to fall on the sword rather than see her baby split by the sword. The mother's heart was, I may never get to hug my son again. I may, I may never get to kiss my son on the cheek again. I, I may never hold my son in my arms and feed him ever again. I, I, will, I will not get to see my son grow up. I won't see him go through his teenage years. I won't see him get married. I won't get to see his kids. I'm not going to see any of that. But you know what? I'm prepared to risk all of that. Please don't, please, please, please don't split the baby. Jesus said, the difference between the hireling and the shepherd is how they respond to the, fo to the, to the wolf. He said, when the wolf comes in and tries to attack the sheep, the shepherd, he'll fight for the sheep. He'll stand there. He'll, he'll, he'll take the full brunt of the wolf to protect the sheep. David, when he was about to fight Goliath, because he was a shepherd, he says, man, this is nothing for you. I, I can stand in the gap and fight for the people. Why? Because I've been fighting for the sheep. And I fought against the bear, and I fought against the lion, and I'm not intimidated by any attack, but I'm not going to run because I'm not a hireling. I'm not a, I'm not a hired servant. I'm not in this for what I can get out of it. I'm in this for the sheep. 
I'm in this for the sheep. The shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hireling will run as soon as there's a challenge. As soon as it gets too hard, as soon as it gets too difficult, as soon as there's no money in it, as soon as there's no opportunity, as soon as there's no name, as soon as there's no title, as soon as there's not something in this for me, the hireling says, man, it's getting too difficult. I'm out of here right now. A true Christian who loves the bride of Christ is not going to pack up their bags in the middle of a pandemic and leave the church because they love the bride of Christ and they want everything for the bride of Christ. We're not in, maybe it's not comfortable for you and maybe it's not great for you right now and maybe it's a difficult, maybe you don't agree with every situation and maybe you don't agree with every decision but now is not the time to pack up your bags and leave just because the wolf is trying to come in and destroy the church. You lay your life down for the sheep and say, God, don't split the baby. I don't care what it takes. I'll wear a mask or not wear a mask. I'll show up early. I'll sign your piece of paper. You can take my temperature. What? It says I'm hot. That's great. You know, whatever, whatever. (laughs) Whatever it takes, God. But please don't split the baby. Don't split the baby. This is our time to be united. This is our time to be together. Don't Don't let racial division take us out. We do have racial issues in America. There needs to be change of systematic racism in America. It is true. It is real. It's been here. And there's got to be change. But this is not the time to divide on that. This is the time to unite on that. This is the time to come together on that and be the church and bring healing. Why are we arguing about these things in the church? This is the time to bring healing. Healing to the body. Healing to our nation. This is our most important time. And in a nation that's divided by politics, a nation that's divided on social media by all sorts of craziness, this is not our time to abide and to buy into the division. This is a time to lose ourselves. This is a time to lose ourselves. And just say, man, how can I participate and make this thing better? Let me pray for you. Holy Spirit, overshadow us. Just as you prayed, Father, make us one, as you are one. You are a perfect unity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this should be your church. The beauty of the church, the wonder of this church, is that we are so different. Our our difference is our beauty. Our cultural backgrounds. Our ethnicity makes the church beautiful. It's been said that the church is the most segregated place on a Sunday in America. God, that shouldn't be us. The most united place on a Sunday should be the church. We come together in different colors, different skin shades, different backgrounds, different upbringings, different cultural values, different education, different political persuasions. But we come together as the church the beautiful body of Christ. And I pray for the Cure Church today. That you would knit our heart as one. Would you all stand right across this place right now? I I, I feel as I'm praying this prayer that There are some people here today, and I'm I'm going to pray with you right where you're at. So I'm just going to get you to raise your hand. I'm not not, going to take long. Um, But I I feel as as I was praying that prayer, I felt like the Holy Spirit told me there's people here today, and you're hurting. There's hurt from things that have been said. There's just things that have been said recently, um, maybe to you on social media or to you from friends or other Christians or maybe even people in this church. There's things that have been said, someone said. Someone said, the woman said, 
the devil said, someone said something to you, and, and it's, you're hurting. You're carrying that load. And it's try, you can feel it trying to tear you away. There's somebody here today, and you feel it trying to tear you away from your family. What's being said is trying to tear you away from your family. Others, it's trying to tear you away from relationships. Others, it's trying to tear you away from the church. If that's you, maybe I can have somebody just come and sing behind me. If that's you, just raise your hand right now. If that's you, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Just hold your hands up right there. Holy Spirit, you see these hands. Wonderful people. Beautiful people that you love, that you care about, that you value. Lord God, that the, the enemy with divisions trying to tear them away. We pray, Holy Spirit, by, by your love and your grace right now, as we gather together as your body, breathing in the Holy Spirit, that you would bring healing to these situations. Lord God, I pray that you'd protect their heart. You'd protect their mind. You'd protect their spirit. There's somebody here today, I pray that you'd protect their finances. What, what's been said has created a financial challenge. What's been done has created a financial stress. And I pray, God, that you would show you are Jehovah Jireh. You're the God who sees our need and you see our need, you provide. And I pray in this situation that you would show your hand and do a miracle financial transfer. I pray that you do a miracle financial blessing. I pray that you do a miracle financial reversal right now in Jesus' name. Lord, take that burden and take that stress off what's been said. Lift it off right now. Let these people be able to walk out of church today free. Lord, I pray for those that have had something said and it's incredibly hurtful. We can't make light of how hurtful that has been to your spirit. And right now, I pray that the grace of God and the renewing of God and God's, God's mercy would rest on you right now. Father, heal. Heal that brokenness. Heal that hurt. Heal that pain. Heal that stress. Lord God, right now, in Jesus' name, let the Holy Spirit just flood you right now. Let the Holy Spirit flood you right now. Come on, church. Let's pray together. Let the Holy Spirit flood them right now. Come on, flood them right now. Fill them with the Holy Ghost. Fill them with healing right now. Heal, healing virtue from heaven right now. Come on, God. 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 Fill them with the Holy Spirit right now. Fill them with the healing power right now. There's somebody in your hands up for prayer and you shed many tears. You shed many tears and this thing that's been said has brought a weight on you. You're carrying a weight. There's a burden. There's a heaviness resting on you right now and you're carrying that weight. Holy Spirit, I pray, number one, you dry the tears. Dry the tears. And number two, Holy Spirit, just lift the weight off them right now. Let them leave today feeling that burden gone. Let them leave light-footed. Let them leave singing. Let them leave with their head up, rejoicing. Let them leave today, God, with that spirit of heaviness broken in Jesus' name. The spirit of grace filling them right now. Right now. Will you stretch your hands out towards your pastors? Father, we thank you for this great man and woman of God. We thank you that you've called them to lead and lead wisely in this season. We thank you that they're men and women that seek after counsel, that go after information and wisdom. And we pray, God, that you would surround them with a team that would fight in the trenches with them. And we pray that you'd surround them with a team that would yield their heart to wisdom and vision. And we pray that you'd surround them with a people, Lord God, that would say, Pastor, we're with you. Pastor, we're in this together. We are the body. We are the body. We're here through thick and thin. We're not here for what this church can do for me, but we're here, God, for what we can do in this church. Lord God, we're here to build your vision. We're here to build your kingdom. We're here to establish something that sees souls saved in the city of Kansas, Lord God, and the surrounding areas. Lord God, gather us together as a body that we'd be one walking in unity, that we'd be a church that you could look at 
And so unified in direction, so unified in division, so unified in spirit that you could command your blessing, life forevermore. Life forevermore. On the church, the church family, on our children, on our children's children, and on our children's children for generations to come. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Je- with every eye closed and watching online, maybe you're not right with God. Maybe you've never joined this wonderful thing called the church. Well, it just begins with a relationship with Jesus. It begins by becoming a Christian. By just saying to God, you know what, God, I've done wrong, but I need to get it right. I've done it my own way. I need to do it your way. I'm sorry for living my own way. I'm sorry for my sin, my mistakes. Please forgive me. Please receive me just like I am. And God will give you a fresh start in your life and relationship with God. If that's you, I'm going to invite everybody to pray this prayer with me and everybody watching online to pray this prayer with me, asking exactly that. But if this is you today and you need a fresh start in your life and relationship with God, make it your prayer. Make it your prayer. You pray that. Somebody will tell you what the next step is after that uh, a little bit later. But this is your first step in that journey. Let's all pray together. Say this with me. Say, Dear Jesus, I come to you today and I'm asking you for a fresh start in my life and relationship with you. Please forgive me for all my past and today give me a brand new start. I ask you to receive me just as I am and to make me a child of God, a Christian, a part of the family of God. And let that take place right here, right now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you this morning.